Hey guys, now today's video is going to be talking about something a little bit different to the type of subject matter that we normally discuss on this channel. Um, I'm going to be talking about music and also ways of listening to music on the go. As anybody that knows me in my everyday life, friends and family, will tell you that I'm a massive music fan. Always have been, probably always will be. And in fact, for many years, um, I used to work as a DJ. Uh, seven nights a week, playing in bars and nightclubs all over the UK and all around Europe, playing house music in UK Garage, and, you know, I pretty much got my way through university by DJing for several years in a row. And even today, you know, I do a lot of work from home in my home office here. I've always got music playing on the speakers in my home office. If you see me walking around town, normally got my earphones in or in the car I've got music playing. And today, having music on the go is the easiest thing in the world. You know, I've always got my iPhone in my pocket. Um, I've got services like Spotify, Mixcloud, Soundcloud installed on here as well. And in fact, um, only the other week, me and my girlfriend had a week in Italy and brought a little set of Bluetooth speakers, um, had Wi-Fi in the hotel room. So when we're getting ready to go out on the evening or the mornings, had my iPhone hooked up to Wi-Fi and was actually streaming our music collection from home through Google Music where I backed everything up and, you know, we're listening to our entire music collection a thousand miles around the world. So, you know, it's incredible the fact that now you can have your entire music collection in your pocket 24 seven. So it's dead simple to listen to music wherever you are now, but it wasn't always so easy. Now, people of my kind of age and generation, or probably even older actually, will remember making your own mixtapes when you were a kid and a teenager. I used to do it all the time. When I was a little kid, I'd always have my cassette recorder and I'd record my mum's records and cassette tapes, you know, and the uh, the tape to tape recorders. So I'd have my own copies of it, um, even taping stuff like the the top forty off the radio on Sunday afternoons. And then in my teenage years, I got a set of DJ decks in my bedroom, and we'd often um, me and my friends would do mixes for each other, and you'd always trade tapes at school and everything. And if you actually did a really good mix, it could stay in your cassette tape Walkman for like a week or a month even, you know, you listen to the same thing over and over again. Because doing a new tape was time consuming, you have to sit there and do it in real time. And uh, often you'd mess up and have to redo it. So it could be the best part of an afternoon to get a two hour tape in your pocket. And I always thought at the time that one day, this is gonna be a lot easier, rather than having to sit there and do it in real time. And obviously, you know, today, as I demonstrated a moment ago, it is. And the thing about cassettes as well, even though I always had my cassette tape Walkmans on me, um, the quality was never amazing. I was never really satisfied, even using stuff like the metal and the chrome tapes and stuff like that. The tapes would get chewed up quite easily, they kind of degrade over time. And it was actually a bit of a revolution when I got my first recordable um, digital device in the late 90s. I think I was just going into college when I got my first ever Sony mini disc player. And this was absolutely incredible. And it really gave you the quality of CD, but with the flexibility of cassette tapes. And I think my first mini disc player, I think it cost me about two or 300 pounds. Got it for my birthday, when I was probably about yeah, 17 years old, 16, 17. And I got loads of mini discs. And around that time in the late 90s, it seemed all of my friends suddenly abandoned their cassette players and we all did mini disc and swap discs and stuff like that. There was actually even a few commercial discs in the shops, but it never really took off in a big way. Um, not really in the way that Sony hoped, I don't think. But I was a big fan of mini disc, and later on there was some kind of um, digital based mini disc players that you could hook them up to your computer and transfer files onto them. But you know, for, for a time, you could get 74 minutes on here in standard play. Uh, some of the later players, like I think this one does, actually had long play mode, so you could either double or quadruple the time with the uh, sacrifice of quality, unfortunately. Um, but mini disc is really good, you know, I've still got a bunch of mini discs around. Don't really use them anymore, but it's nice to kind of still have mixes that I recorded back in like, you know, 1999, 2000. And it was actually in the year 2000, not long before I went away to university, that I got my first MP3 player. I do remember reading at the time about how MP3 was going to revolutionise music and uh, you no longer, the big thing was you didn't have to sit there and record things in real time anymore. It was literally drag and drop from your machine and... Um, the quality wouldn't degrade, you could copy them as many times as you want. And my first MP3 player was uh, this thing here, a Diamond Rio. And I'll give you a closer look at it in a minute. But really the design of it wasn't amazing, it had a tiny little um, LCD screen up here. And the, um, the tracks 
would kind of scroll along there. Uh, but I think there's like a character limit. You know, if you had more than like 20 characters, it wouldn't show or it didn't scroll or something like that. I haven't used it for a long, long time. And you kind of had your play and control buttons in the middle there. It was very fiddly to use. And uh, at the time this came out, I think this has actually got, it, it's a flash storage device, has actually come on there. So it does still work by the looks of it. <laughs> Amazingly, it still charges as well. Um, but yeah, flash storage is very pricey. So this thing only had 32 megabytes of onboard RAM. And I've actually got a 32 megabyte SD card in the bottom of it too. And uh, oh, the battery's just died. <laughs> and looking at what it said on the screen there a second ago, the song that I was playing then was in 32 kilobits per second MP3. So uh, yeah, I mean, literally, I think you could get about 100 songs on if they were in that quality. I've still got the box for my um, Diamond Rio player as well, which is a bit amusing to look at in hindsight. Um, there you go. Internet music in the palm of your hand, it says. MP3 files on the PC, internet or CD can be transferred to it. And uh, this kind of predated MP3 being popular as well. So this actually got a parallel interface. And I got this around the time I got my first Windows PC. As anyone that watches my channel regularly, you'll know that, you know, I'm a big Amiga fan, always have been. And uh, my mum got me a Windows 98 PC just before I went to uni in like 2000, 2001. And uh, yeah, I kind of, I still brought my Amiga with me, even though she said, you know, we need to get you a proper computer now, sacrilege. Um, took it away with me, and actually, that was one of the main uses for my Windows, 8 P uh, Windows 98 PC, was transferring files onto my MP3 player. And uh, it was, you know, it was cool at the time because you could have something different to listen to every day. You know, in the morning, as I'm brushing my teeth, I'd drag a few new MP3s on there that I'd downloaded off Napster or something like that. Um, Audio Galaxy, those other file sharing services, or ripped on my own, you know, from my own CD collection. And you could have something different every day and you wouldn't have to sit there for an hour, two hours and record a cassette tape or a mini disc in real time. But the thing that really changed it and really changed the world of digital music was one player. And you all know the one I'm going to talk about, the iconic Apple iPod. And I got mine in 2002, I think I got this one. This is actually the first Apple iPod. And this came out in late 2001, November 2001 in America. A bit later over here in the UK, I got it summer 2002. Cost me, I think it was around 399 pounds. It cost a fair bit um, for a student in particular, but as I said, I was doing a lot of DJing work at the time, so I managed to afford it. And um, there's a lot of differences from what the iPad, uh, iPod became a bit later, including the fact that it was Mac only and uh, Firewire um, didn't have USB support or anything like that. So we'll have a little look at the original iPod. Mine is actually still in quite good working order. And um, I've always been a big fan of iPods, you know, I don't really use them much today, but I've actually got quite a big collection of them. At one time, for some reason, I did actually get into collecting iPods for some reason. So I've got pretty much, you know, all of the models of iPods that came out for a good few years. This is about the only one that gets any use. It's my 160 gig um, iPod Classic that I got about 2010, I think. And this is actually still good for taking away, you know, if I go somewhere I haven't got internet connectivity. Um, but the rest of them don't see a lot of use anymore. But I thought it might be quite historically interesting to kind of have a bit of an inspection on the original Apple iPod and see where kind of the digital music revolution really began, if you like. So here we go, the first ever Apple iPod and uh, the device that really did change the world. I mean, I know, as I obviously showed you before, there were digital music players before the iPod, but this is really the one that made mp3 players a mainstream platform and um the one that definitely got the most media attention now it's quite interestingly that um apple announced the original ipod in late 2001 at a very low-key event that i think was actually held at apple's headquarters by steve jobs it wasn't kind of the big you know mac world premiere or you know the wwdc announcement or anything it was literally an event they called the apple music event held at their hq in 2001 and this is the device that Steve Jobs unveiled on stage. Now, at the time, they made a big deal about the fact that, you know, um, the user interface on um, previous products like the Diamond Rio player that I showed you before was very fiddly, and the fact that, you know, storage on them was a bit bleh. There wasn't really enough space on them. And this, they made a massive deal about the fact that it actually included a five gigabyte hard disk. Now, in their advertising back then, they described this as having a thousand songs in your pocket which if you stored them at 128 kbps, I think you could actually fit a thousand songs on this thing. Um, so, you know, the, the claim was true, and that was kind of how a lot of songs were downloaded back then in 128k. 
and uh, they made also a big deal about the fact that it was only the size of a deck of cards. So this is a design, of course, that they stuck with right until the uh, you know the later days of the iPod. We've got the the fourth generation here, the um, the U2 version of the the iPod Photo, and uh, right up to the one that they still sell today, actually, and will probably be the final ever iPod Classic. Um, I've heard rumours for years are going to be phasing these out, but this is the 160 gigabyte um, iPod Classic, as they call it at the moment. And as you can see, there is quite a lot that they did stick with throughout the entire lifespan of the iPod. You know, the scroll wheel and the uh, the placing of the navigation button. So you've got the fast forward, rewind, play and pause. It all stayed the same. The menu button and the, the select button in the middle here. The big difference was that in later models of the iPod, like the ones that we have today, this is actually a touch capacitive scroll wheel so um, obviously that will spin around with your finger on the first ever iPod this is actually a physical wheel so it travels around with your finger as you can see it's spinning there I'm giving it a little push and it continues to spin around so that was one of the major differences and um, I've got to say in use actually I did kind of quite like that as um, it kind of felt like it was a bit more responsive than the the ones that we have today now it was quite thick in comparison as well so we compare the the latest model to the first ever one bearing in mind this is 160 gigs and that is five gigabytes obviously they both got physical hard disks in them you know moving parts they did come down a lot in price and shrink in size and become a lot more affordable and um had bigger storage capacities over the years since 2001 obviously and uh, looking around it it's kind of got that same brushed metal look that we get today quite shiny um mine's seen better days if i'm honest you know it's been in my pocket with uh keys and coins and all that kind of things it is quite scratched up but as you can see on the back there you've got the the apple logo in white as the current ipods still do um the big difference is if you look on the bottom the dock connector that we all know and love today the 32 bin connector that was um, standard on all ipods after this one is absent on the first ever ipod instead it uses a standard firewire port on the top here now the reasons for apple using firewire were uh, numerous really firstly because it was a standard that they kind of pioneered and um, had on all their products but also you've got to remember when this came out 2001 usb 2.0 wasn't really commonplace it was still usb 1.1 which was very slow for moving large amounts of data for example full albums and firewire 400 and this device could actually transfer information about four or five times quicker, if not more, but might have even been up to eight times quicker. So it did make sense for them to use it. The only thing is, um, the kind of connector they used on it, it was a full-size Firewire port, and it wasn't really designed to be used in products like this. You know, it was really more for external storage, um, sturdy hard disks, and also cameras as well. So obviously with a device like the iPod, you'd be expected to plug it in and out of your Mac, maybe, you know, could be four or five times every day and as you can see firewire is this really big clunky connector so you're putting that in and it takes some force you know it locks in there and then taking it out you've got to give it a little bit of a wiggle as it is quite stiff and the problem with a lot of these early ipods is by the time you've inserted and removed that connector you know several times a day for 10 years um the solder joints to the motherboard of the ipod actually become loose so you get dry solder um or as happened in mine actually this kind of rattled around it actually came completely off the motherboard so i had to reopen it and reflow the solder and um, put it back on the board worked fine after that but if you've got one of these old ipods and um it no longer charges or transfers information or the connector's a bit wobbly that's probably what happened as i know that was a really big complaint after the ipod first came out so as you can see here i've actually by plugging it in i've turned on the ipod now and we've got the uh, the home screen there so if i go on the top here um, we've got the headphone jack, so that is a standard um, headphone connector that's still in use today, 3.5 millimeters, I believe it is. Um, a hole button there that locks it down so you can't accidentally press things in your pocket. And um, there is actually a backlight on the screen too, so I can press that and there you go, the screen actually lights up, makes it a bit easier to see on camera. And if you listen, there is a little clicking sound when I move the scroll wheel. The way that works, the wheel doesn't actually make a sound itself. There is a small speaker underneath it, so it's kind of that, you know, Apple attention to detail thing that they've always been famous for. So if we have a little look through, there is still some music on here from uh, way back when. We'll have a little look. Um, let's play something off here. So I click on that. And remember there is a, a very old hard disk in here. 
So now it's spinning up, and uh, as you can maybe hear, it is playing music now for turn it up a little bit. So we'll press up in the middle, like on all iPods later. You know, you get the volume control there. Um, there you go. And as I mentioned, it was actually a bit simpler to um, navigate around the songs, I think, with the actual physical wheel that span around. So if you click it, you can see, you know, the timeline there. I think it was a bit easy to move and fast forward and navigate around your songs with that. Did always kind of prefer that to the uh, later touch sensitive wheels that we had. So if I go back to the uh, main menu, I'll show you a few of the options that we've got here. So we've got extras, which would give you a clock. Um, that's lost a couple of days. I'm recording this on the 1st of July and the, the time is wrong, but you know, it's pretty near <laughs> considering it hasn't been used for a while. Um, contacts as well. You could actually transfer contacts from your Mac and have them on your iPod. So you've got a template one here for um, Apple, no doubt. Yes, it is. And you might be thinking, well, you know, there's no phone feature in this. What's the point in doing that? Back then in 2001, we had mobile phones, but you have to remember back then, most people had phones that stored their contacts on their SIM cards. So I think my phone held about 20, 30 contacts. So it had a finite amount, but you know, you could store a lot more on your iPod. So it was actually quite useful. And um, you've got a calendar there as well. Um, that you could set reminders on and stuff too, if you transfer that from iCal on your Mac. And um, there's a game as well, which was a little breakout clone that you control with the scroll wheel that did used to keep me entertained for quite a while actually in boring lectures at university and uh, on train and bus journeys and stuff like that and you could listen to music while you're playing it as well apart from that really I mean you've got all these standard you know music features and EQ settings and all that kind of thing they came with the later iPods so they did kind of you know perfect the interface pretty much from day one and uh, the thing is you know actually you can plug this into a Mac that's still got a Firewire port now or um into a Windows PC if you've got one that supports Windows, and it will. Today, iTunes will still recognize this original iPod. Um, if I use OS X on my PowerPC Mac, I can still sync and um, transfer information to and from this iPod. So, you know, props to Apple for supporting it, even though it came out, like, you know, 13 years ago. So, really, I mean, it's the iconic design that changed the world, really, the iPod. So, I thought it might be historically quite interesting to have a little look at it and give you a little overview of the first ever Apple iPod. Any comments, leave them below. Maybe you had one of these back then. Um, maybe you've got an interest in it. You've got some questions you want to ask. Maybe you had a different MP3 player. Were you a fan of the creative ones? Did you have a Nomad, something like that? <laughs> I know there was a lot of uh, tribalism back then. Leave a comment. There'll also be links to my social media networks. Follow me on um, Twitter, our Facebook group, facebook.com slash kookytech, the blog at kookytech.net. All of that info will be in the video description. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.